really today we're talking about moving past the past and how heritage brands really should be looking at the future. And Bob, I'd actually like to start with you. You know, you're leading one of the most important global luxury brands in the world. Both of you are, actually. But particularly for you, I'd love to understand how you're addressing, you know, the new customer, the millennial, you know, how you think about, um, and is it any different in bringing the, the heritage of Hermes to the new consumer? And are there new methods of engagement that you're employing at Hermes? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I would say that we, we are constantly trying to be consistent in our message. Uh, the message really being about quality, craftsmanship, and service. And so you have to deliver that same message even to the next generation or to new uh, customers that we're trying to reach. One of the ways that we're trying to reach these new customers is really through different experiences, I would say. Uh, a couple of things that we have done recently, for example, uh, the Hermes Matic event, which is basically an Hermes laundromat. Uh, but people could come in, you could, you could dip dye your, your, your old scarf, uh, give it a new color, give it a new life. Uh, but it was sort of a fun, engaging experience. Uh, we just did a Carré Club event yes. also. Uh, another sort of fun, engaging experience. It's really to, to make the brand more uh, approachable, uh, a bit friendlier, uh, and not so intimidating. Uh, so we continue to do those types of things to reach out to not just a, a younger audience, but really a broader audience overall. Yeah, and it's interesting because I know that Hermes has never really used the word marketing. Um, that you really look at communications and invest in communications in a way that in the old days we always used to look at your windows and say, oh my God, you know, they bring art and design and fashion together so beautifully. So thinking about the Carré Club and some of the other things you're doing, um, is that about making the brand more accessible or is that more of a continuation of the heritage or, or both? It's a combination of both, I would say. Uh, it, it's really making it more accessible, making it fun, uh, making it different. Uh, but also, you know, today with, with so much business being done online, it also gives people a reason uh, for coming right. into the brick and mortar uh, uh, stores. Uh, it's, it's an extension of our, of our stores. Uh, and it's a great way to, to introduce people, or first time people, the, the Carré Club event, for example, was in the meatpacking yes. district. So, so most of the people who came to the Carré Club are people that would almost never go up on Madison Avenue. Uh, so it's a, it's a great way to, like I said, to broaden your customer base. I mean, to that end, Mercedes, I know that um, you and I had a great conversation about millennials over the phone and how Cartier and yourself are really thinking about millennials. How is that, how are you thinking about this new generation of consumers? And I know you're also doing some things to move outside of your more traditional lane in terms of retail. Well, yeah, that's true, Karen. I think one of the things um, I would say, though, is that the millennials are part of our overall client strategy. They're not the client strategy um, because we are about being um, a bold and fearless and pioneering female audience as, as our primary with, of course, some, some elegant men as well. But there are women of that mindset in all age groups, yes. um, in all countries. Yes. So it's a bit of more of a state of mind and a um, being creative and open-mindedness and, and being able to express yourself and making sure that we are speaking that language in our communication. S similar, similarly to Bob, we have done a few new things. Like we, have, we had our um, traveling um, precious garage in yes. September, which was a, um, a, a launch for our Just on Clue small collection, and we basically took it to new audiences. We took it to Nashville, we took it to Seattle, to places where we don't currently have oh. a store, to again engage with different creative, yes, younger, but also, again, women of all age who have that mindset. So, so we're looking at how do we take the strength of this 170-year-old Maison with its core um, values of being very timeless and very strong, but also making it very relevant to today's audience. And, and we find very frequently that millennial can be also shopping with their mother, their aunt. You know, yes. there, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's part of our overall connection with our audience, but it's always about getting new clients, and no matter what the age, because it's a mindset more than an age. It's really interesting, as I was thinking about our conversation today, I was thinking I'm so fortunate because 
these are really the two luxury brands that I genuinely think have been the best at storytelling over the years. And, and again, with Windows and various different activations for Hermes and for Cartier, I think I laid awake last night, I watched about 14 or 15 videos and I wasn't as aware as I probably should have been of the engagement that you have with artists and mm -hmm. poets and writers and actors with women and, and, and men in different environments. Can you say a little bit about sort of the genesis of that? Absolutely. I mean, again, being, being a, a very feminine maison, um, we have a few key aspects that we can really um, activate that in. For, for more than 10 years now, we've had the Cardia Women's Initiative Awards. Um, where we have uh, created a foundation where we fund early stage female entrepreneurs. Um, this coming year will award almost a million dollars wow. in funding money to the finalists. Um, but not only getting the funding for their business, but we give them access to this community. So we engage them with venture capitalists, with coaches, um, get them involved in creating this community. And it fits very much into to who we are, like you said. Um, so we've been doing it for quite a while, more because it's true to who we are. It fits very much yes. into the values of being a you know, strong feminine maison. Um, but in terms of the art community, like what you said, is we've had the, the foundation for contemporary art for Cartier in Paris for over 30 years. Um, so we've always had a connection to artists. Um, so it's natural for us to have those dialogues, create that community, very specifically separate in a way from the business to, to be more authentic and to carry that, that through the centuries. It's really interesting. And, and moving to technology, I mean, the Hermes, Apple Watch collaboration, Bob, is a beautiful one and one that I think has um, gained tremendous attention. But I think you're doing other things and I always think, gee, is it a little bit of an oxymoron for a brand like Hermes to be engaging with technology? But um, actually you're doing some interesting things. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, our, our most interesting experiment recently was in Palo Alto. We opened a new store in Palo Alto. And what we did was we uh, implemented a couple of new technological elements there that we uh, are, are really first time uh, elements uh, and that hopefully we will expand them to other stores. Uh, but for example, we have our first digital scarf. Uh, so usually wow. we have the scarf wall, we have to change right. the scarf all the time. So we did a digital scarf uh, a display, which is great because it changes every 30 seconds. So it's very eye-catching, it's very different. Uh, and then we uh, put a couple of uh, screens uh, inside of the scarf counter and the jewelry accessory counter where people can really peruse the entire mm -hmm. collection uh, on their own or with a sales associate if they like. Uh, what it does is rather than, than people asking to have the scarves unfolded, or sometimes people say, please, please don't unfold all the scarves. <laughs> it, it gives yeah. them a comfort level to, to be able to look for something, and then when they find a color or a design that they like, then they will ask the salesperson to, uh, uh, to assist them with that. Uh, and then we also have a digital art wall, uh, which we uh, implemented uh, it's, as well. It's beautiful. Uh, so yeah. these are, these are, this is a big step for us. You know, uh, we, we do things very, very <laughs> slowly. So we're, we're finally coming into the 21st century. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I know that um, Hermes has always had this really interesting st structure that the CEOs for each region can really pick and choose essentially on your own what you feel of all the initiatives being created can be integrated. That must be very freeing and a little bit scary. What's that like for you? Uh, well, it's actually really, it's, it's really great because it allows us to have our own identity yeah. here and it allows us to respond to the market uh, as, as we know best. Uh, I mean, our store directors still, they go twice a year to do their own buys because we believe that they know the client right. better than anyone else. So the, the Beverly Hills you know, store director is going to buy for their market, very different from what the Boston store director is going to buy for, you know, for his market. That's super interesting. And back to technology, um, I did ask you a question which I thought you gave me a great answer for. My question was, um, how have smart watches impacted your watch business, which I understand is not as large as a jewelry business, but clearly very important to the heritage of the brand and still very important. What can you share with the uh, audience? Yeah, I mean, we are like? a jeweler and a watchmaker. Um, the, the split of the business, we don't report out, but does vary country to country. Uh, I think the answer to that is um, the 
we have time pieces that withstand that that time. So you may you normally would purchase one of our time pieces for a memorable moment, something in your life that you want to mark. So most of our clients are doing it for whether it's a birthday, a graduation, a wedding, wedding anniversary, a new job. And these are things that you remember, whether you wear them every day or not, you remember why you purchased that for yourself or yes. why you were given that. And, and I think what we see, and it's really different client to client, is that people are looking for now a wardrobe of watches. So they're looking for a lot of different ways and styles and things to wear. And Cartier is, is very proud to be in the middle of all that. Um, and, and tech watches are not um, exactly consistent with who we are, but we welcome anything that is going to have our, our younger audiences putting things on their wrist and, mm -hmm. and, and, and growing them into this being a part of their wardrobe and a piece of their identity and part of who they speak to. You also mentioned, and, and, and maybe this is not appropriate, but that sometimes you see people wearing both at I have the same seen time. That. I have seen that <laughs> in some of, um, I would say, the, the more major cities, like New York and yeah. LA, I've seen that, um, which is interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> it is indeed. One on each wrist. It, constant change going <laughs> exactly. on. You never know. Um, I think, uh, Karen, if you don't yeah. mind, from the technology standpoint, I would just like to say what's interesting for us is we see technology as a way to make the customer experience yes. more seamless. It's just going um, Similar to what, to what um, Bob was saying, it's about how to make the relationship stronger yes. between the client and us. And we're really moving into, instead of that being very transactional, a lot of people coming in the store, a lot of people coming into the website, that it's really about the personalized experience that you have with us. So do you want something that is fast and convenient? Do you want a longer experience yes. engaging with your sales associate on the phone or in the store? So whatever we can do, some of it is obvious to the clients, and a lot of it is not, to make that more seamless, to make that relationship stronger. And to Bob's point, you, you, we want to um, engage people so that they do want to come in and, 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 um, and bond with the brand. Yeah, and I think that seamless technology, especially for a luxury brand, is also incredibly important. Sort of going to the question of physical retail versus online, uh, maybe Bob, uh, you first. You, you both, both brands seem very bullish on physical retail right now. Bob, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the world's all going online, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people online, but there's, there's the majority of the business is still done in stores. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we're still very bullish about our, our brick and mortar uh, program. Uh, we continue to look at new, new cities, new locations. Uh, next year, for example, we're opening in the meatpacking district uh, in the spring. Uh, we think it's a, a dynamic neighborhood. It's a place, as, as I said earlier, uh, there, there are people that shop on Madison Avenue that never go downtown and, and vice versa. Right. So we have to sort of find these special places where we can capture you know, a broader audience. I, I don't like to say younger audience, I like to say broader audience because, because both are really uh, important to us. Uh, but we continue to look for new and different locations. Uh, for in Palm Beach, for example, uh, we moved off of Worth Avenue uh, because we felt that the traffic patterns were really changing. Yes. So we moved into what I would call a lifestyle uh, mm -hmm. shopping center, uh, which is the Royal Poinciana. Yeah. Uh, it's been very, very successful, I have to say. A lot of people thought we were making a big mistake. But I think people are, are, are they're shopping differently today. You know, it's not, it's not luxury brand after luxury brand after luxury brand. It's right. really about, you know, the, the health, the wellness, the restaurants, uh, the, you know, the diversity of, of what's being offered. Uh, and that's really what we're looking for. And by doing that, I think we're, you're, you're seeing the traffic uh, improve uh, more and more uh, in brick and mortar stores. And Mercedes, how, I know there's at least one new store coming up that's, probably quite interesting. It is, it is. So we are going to be the other end of the, the west side from, yeah. from Bob. We're going to be in the Hudson Yards complex. Yeah. Um, you know, for us, it's, it's similar. We're co constantly looking for the way to um, be more agile in where do, we, where do we see our clients, where are they going. Um, so we'll be in the new complex when it opens in March in a, in a, in a uh, prime position. And it's the same thing in the sense of, you know, being where our clients live, work, and play. Um, it isn't just a, you know, all luxury destination anymore right. in many of these environments. It's about being where they live their lives and being part of their lives. And then that, you know, feeds back into that relationship that I mentioned earlier. It's about being part of their day-to-day. Um, and, and being where they want to be, even if it's just stopping in to 
say hello. So I, I think for us, it's, it's similar. You know, online is, is growing, but um, physical retail is still the majority of, of the presence and majority of the sales. And it's about how do we make sure that our organization is nimble enough to adjust to that so we can be um, in tune with our clients when they, when they go in different directions. Thank you. So shifting a little bit to people and teams, there is so much change going on. Bob, you and I were talking backstage very briefly just five, six years ago, things did look very different. Um, even though I think Hermes first went online in 2002, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, what's it like internally? Um, do most of your team sort of get the change in consumer behavior and, or is there work that you need to do to um, sort of educate them and help them understand how and why things are moving the way they're moving and, you know, in a way I think making Hermes more accessible, do people think that's a good thing or do they ask questions about it? And then the last part of that is, is there new talent that you have to bring in and is there a change in structure of your organization in order to to really respond to the needs of this new marketplace? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I have to say that it starts with the culture. Every company has a culture. And, and the culture that we have at Hermes here in the US is, is one of very, very open communication. It, it's sharing of information. Uh, it's really important because making sure that everybody knows what what the end goal is. You know, what's our goal for this year? I, I, I'm <coughs> happy to, to say that if you walked into any Hermes boutique in the United States and you asked a salesperson, what is our sales goal for this year? They will tell you what the huh. goal is this year. And that's important because yes. if everybody's on board, everybody's moving in the same direction. So by doing that, the people and the talent that we are bringing in that, that needs to, to balance it. You know, we, we do need people that are, that are, are, are techies. We do need people also that are, are very service oriented and, and you still need people that are that are old fashioned, you know, retailers like me. I'm an old fashioned retailer. <laughs> but you still have to have that because you, you still see things. Yes. I, was, I was sharing with Mercedes this morning that I finished a meeting downtown and I can't help it. I still walk through Macy's. Yes. I just want to see what's going on. <laughs> Uh, and we shared a few things that are going on, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's for another day. Uh, but it's really, it, it's really important, and I think if you, if you set that standard and you, and, you, and you nurture that culture, that's really how you, you build an organization and, and get everybody to be moving all in the same direction uh, and, and seeing and understanding what the challenges are so that someone doesn't say, well, we have to put more emphasis online or we have to put more emphasis in store. They, they know that the total goal is to really be omni-channel. And yes. so if you, if you get the message across, people will, will really think omni-channel all the time. Yes, oh, that's, that's, that's really terrific. And Mercedes, what, what's it like What's it been like the last few years in it's, some it's of these It's definitely changes? been a shift in terms of the speed, certainly, yeah. of the way that we all need to work, the speed of which things are changing. Um, the great news about that is as you bring new people into the organization, either be at very junior levels or even more senior, is that when you infuse new energy, it's, it, it engages the, the existing teams. Um, but I agree with Bob, you need, a, you need a balance. You need the teams that really know the DNA and the heritage of, of the brand. Um, and who continue to want to see it grow and be even more successful. And then you need the ones that come in with a different perspective and a different point of view. Um, I think for us, it's uh, about making sure in addition to being very client-centric and is being team-centric. And because you need yes. the teams, they are a client too. Yes. And to the point about culture, they are our internal clients and making sure that they feel that they are part of the future of this Maison, both the current and the future. And, and we talk a lot about legacy. You know, when you have a 170 year old brand, you are a steward of that yes. along the way to its next journey. And, and yes. the, the exciting part of that responsibility is definitely there. Um, but it's always a work in progress in the sense that you, um, I think I find we need to communicate even more than we did before, more frequently, more often, in different ways, um, and it, making sure, like Bob said, that everybody understands what direction you're going in, and it, that might mean changing the way you work, um, and not just place, physical places, yes. but how you communicate, and, and, and there's a lot of conversation going on internally about how to do that. It's, it's an ongoing yeah. challenge, for sure. Um, both companies, you're both so fortunate that you 
work with companies with such exceptional and authentic heritage. Is it your experience that the new consumers understand the heritage of your brands? Um, do you have sort of data that supports that? Um, and, well, I'll ask the other part of the data question later. So, I guess for you first. Me? Mercedes. Oh, Mercedes. Sorry about that. No, that's right. I wasn't sure who you were. <laughs> um, I, I think me. that um, I think we can always continue to have the conversation with our clients. I think, yes, there is a, a consumer and a client who understands luxury um, because maybe they grew up with it. They knew it. There were people in their family or people in yes. their environment who exposed them to it earlier, especially in, in my world where it's about tradition and gift giving over time. Um, but the, the newer consumer doesn't always have that point of reference. Yes. Um, what they do have, though, is they do a lot of research. Mm. So that's where the online presence, even if it's not always a sale online, it's an education process. Right. So making sure that we are be able to tell that story online and offline in a clear way is really important. Um, and, and just the whole... Um, being very targeted and making sure that we're speaking in a way that is who we are. And, and I would say even with the younger clients, I find some of them are even more interested in the heritage than I would have expected because for them, it's, it's so unique, you know, you know, especially in a, a startup world where people are starting new companies every yes. day. They're very intrigued by how do you manage a brand and keep this yes. alive for as long as you have. So there's an interesting um, shared learning going on. So really, they self-educate quite a bit. They talk to friends. They talk to other people. So, so there's a, a, a whole new way to look at the communication in, in today's world. And Bob? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think that, that the younger generations are, are even more interested in the, in the heritage and the history. Uh, they want to know the stories. They want to hear the stories. Uh, I also think another thing that, that we uh, see is that you know, there's, there's so much discussion about sustainability today. Uh, and I think, I think many, many young people uh, are much more appreciative of a product that's going to last a long time and not something that's going to go out of, out of fashion or out of season, uh, you know, with next season or next year. Uh, and, and there's a deep appreciation for that yes. more and more now. Uh, and that's definitely something that we're, we're feeling. But, but to Mercedes' point, people want to know more and more about the history and they want to, they want to hear all of the, uh, the stories. I can't believe we're out of time. Uh, it was such a pleasure to be with both Thank of you, you again. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.